where this information came from, and again, when it disappears, where they can find it again. And the ink just rearranges itself, right? So it makes for a very meaningful and yet delightful animation. In this example, we're touching a calendar item, right? And that item floats up to the user. You can see it's in a new Z plane. It casts a shadow behind. And it also lets the user know through that animation that this is the detail view for that um, item. Again, it's, it's quite simple, but it's a nice little touch. Okay, this one, this one uh, is quite cool. So take a look at the details. This is about constructive motion. So this is animation that not only preserves context, not only is delightful, but also gives a little bit of instruction to the user. So what happens here is when the user hits this play button, it transforms to reveal more controls, right? But it does something else too. It's subtle. I don't know if anyone notices it, right? But when it transforms, there's a little animation on that volume slider. It sort of like slides into place, right? And so that's the instructive part that's telling the user, hey, you can interact with this thing. You can slide it around. And in fact, that's probably what you want to do the first time you start playing a song. Probably you want to adjust the volume depending on the room that you're in, depending on the headphones you have, right? So this is the animation which gives you that little indication. It's very subtle, but it's nice, right? It's like the app understands what I want to do next, and it's showing me where I can do that. OK, um, asymmetric motion. This is uh, a little bit of a detail, but if you think about these pieces of paper transforming and growing in size through animation, um, it's a little bit hard to see on the screen, but basically what you want to avoid is having the X and Y grow at the same time as the piece of paper enlarges. The reason you want to avoid having it grow proportionally is that it can look like the thing is getting closer to you, right? If you think about the X and Y growing at the same time, it might appear that the sheet of paper is getting closer to the user, and that's not what you want to do when you animate a surface. When you just want to make it bigger, you want to use asymmetric motion, which means that the X or the Y grows first and then followed by the other axis. Yeah, does that make sense? So in the left here, right, we're, we're seeing it um, expand and then grow vertical, right, and then the opposite. So this is just a, a little subtle, subtle thing to make sure that you don't confuse the user with, um, with, uh, with an indication of, of size. Okay, um, and another key motion principle is having users initiate change. So take a look at this animation in the redesign calendar app. Right? So what happens here is the user is in control. Pressing the numbers on the calculator emanates a ripple from the source of where they did the, the best. Right? Material design makes it very, very easy for you to add this sort of effect uh, to your interface. So the user feels very much in control of that. Um, and what's more, right, when, they, when they hit the clear button there, it clears the interface in a very delightful way as well. So again, the user initiated that clear action, and from that epicenter, you have a delightful animation that sort of shows, okay, this is, this is what you did. Um, in Lollipop, you can use the circle reveal animator to get that last effect. Okay, final example. This is from the Google I.O. app uh, for this year. And, and by the way, that's a really great app for you to download and play with. It's open source. Um, every year, a bunch of Google engineers work on that app. One, obviously, to provide a good experience for people who are going to I.O., but probably even more importantly, is to provide a very good reference implementation for best practices um, for what's coming out at I.O. So the I.O. app from this year uses material design principles, as well as a bunch of other best practices. So it's, it's just a great code base. Um, to look at because a bunch of the smartest engineers uh, contributed to that. So in this animation, um, you're, what you're looking at is the button which would add a session to your calendar I.O. So if you saw a session in material design and you wanted to go to it, you would tap this little button, right? Again, you have the effect emanating from the point of touch and it's giving you an instant confirmation without having to open a new window, uh, without having to use any words, and it's using big bold color, right, to, to indicate what's happening. Um, and it's just delightful, right? So you can look at uh, how this example was implemented in the, in the I.O. app. Okie doke. Adaptive design. So this is the final um, aspect that we'll talk about. 
Um, and, and basically the core concept of adaptive design is that the underlying uh, data that you want to convey to your users is the same, right, regardless of what platform they're on. So in the case of the Gmail example, right, it's the same email, it's the same inbox, it's all the same data. And so with material design, you realize that, okay, it's all the same data, and what I need to do is optimize it for the experience or for the device to take advantage of whatever device they're using. Uh, but I don't want to break the user's mental model of what they do with this type of data and how they interact with it. Because ultimately, from a user perspective, it's an email, right? And whether I happen to be on the go or at my desk, shouldn't change how I how I interact with that email. Okay. So here again is our Gmail example. And so um, let's look a little bit at how material design solves uh, solves this problem uh, with consistent colors, with iconography, hierarchy, spatial relationships, and anchors um, all of that into the real world physics that we know that ground material design. Okay, so a very common pattern, right, is this master detail relationship where you have a master list of items and then you tap into one and you get the detail. And, and um, so in the case of hollow, hollow was like a little bit uh, probably too opinionated about some things. One of those was like the arrangement of action bars um, and how you do your, your navigation. Material design is a little bit more flexible. So larger screens can host uh, a number of toolbar strips to use the size effectively and to also <coughs> convey the big bold color. Um, and app bars can be taller where appropriate. And um, you'll see this coming out, obviously, particularly on tablets and on, and on desktop. So there's a little bit of a zoom into, on a tablet, what that interface looks like. And, and you can see the, the action bar, right, is, is much taller on that tablet version than on the phone, which is to the side there. So that's okay now. Uh, and in fact, that's encouraged. Okay, so um, arranging the content using the surfaces and those pieces of paper helps to simplify the decisions around space management for larger screens. So you can set each surface to know its constraints, to know how wide it can get before it stops growing any wider, for example. Um, and so what material design recommends is the use of margins and, again, bold colors to take up the rest of the space. So in this example in the middle, right, um, when we read, there's only a certain length of a line we can read comfortably. Um, and you've probably seen this before, right, where you personally, like, you'll get to a page and it has, like, super long text and you make your browser smaller to make it more comfortable to read, right? So material design encourages this. So in, in this, in this um, piece of paper in the middle, you set a width constraint so it'll grow up to that size. And then you have big, beautiful margins around the side that, again, convey your brand um, and the colors of the ads. Okay. So again, let's dissect a simple phone and tablet app to see how material design um, helps design for tablets. So key lines, uh, if you can see them, they're faint red lines there on the screen. They help to arrange the various elements on that sheet of paper. Um, and they basically aid comprehension and use of space. So it brings a little bit of order to the chaos. And, and it's subtle, but visually when you look at an interface like this, it's the sort of thing that makes you think, oh, this app is really clean, right? And it, it's hard to describe exactly what that is, what, what that psychological feeling is, but one of the things that contributes to that is key lines. It's having all the things nicely lined up, where it helps, helps someone pick up your app and be like, oh yeah, this is clean. I understand what's happening here. Using uh, multiples of the app bar size or increments is now another possibility. So in this example here on the phone, uh, it's 56 dips multiplied three times across for the action bar, and on the, on the tablet it's 64 dips. So it, it's different depending on the device, and you can set that so that it doesn't necessarily have to be the same size across devices. You can, you can take advantage of the extra real estate, real estate. Okay, and let's look at a couple inspiring examples of material design in action. Um, so, of course, material design, like I said, has been built with all the different form factors in mind. And it's flexible enough to let you take center stage with your content and, and your identity. And 
And so you realize that each device is just a view into the same underlying system, the same universe of content. And it's really your app's colors, the typography, the imagery, and the surfaces that help you tell that single story between devices. And uh, that's, that's the power of material design, right? It's simple, but it gives you a metaphor to work with. Okay, and a little bit for Android specifically. Um, theming becomes really important with material design, right? In the hollow days, if you wanted to have like, custom colors for all the components, you had to use some generators, right? You had to download a whole bunch of new assets and package them in your day. And if you wanted to change your color, well, you had to do that all over again. Um, theming is now very, very simple. So you basically are able to define a primary color and an accent color. Um, you can define a couple different accent colors as well. If you look at the I.O. app, there's, there's a couple accent colors defined. And then all the components within your app take on those colors. So it makes it very, very easy for you to distinguish your app from the next app and to have those big, bold colors stand out. Um, as I mentioned, the palette support library is coming out. Um, that's something that you want to look out for and incorporate, particularly if you have imagery within your application. That can serve to, uh, to again, make a consistent experience on the screen. Um, Real-time shadows and elevation, that's something that will work for, for Lollipop and for the older uh, Android versions, you'll fall back to static drawables. Um, but basically, it's again very, very simple. Uh, for Lollipop, right, you just do like Android Elevation 5 gits, and, and that element automatically will cast a shadow for you um, and jump in front of the other uh, pieces of paper in your design. Okay, so animation that's available on Lollipop um, we have activity transitions, we have the ripple touch feedback, reveal animations. Um, and path-based animations. This is all the examples that we've looked at. There's APIs to do this for you. Uh, some of it is very, very simple, uh, like the, the ripple touch feedback is, is very, very easy to implement. Some of the other animations require a little bit more work, uh, but essentially what you want to think about is, how do I use animation to be meaningful and to provide context to my user, right? Uh, and material is not about prettying your app with animation. It's, it's about using that to enhance the, the understanding and the experience. Um, there's a new recycler view, right, with, with better um, memory recycling, uh, which is which is useful for, for UI widgets, um, available in the V7 support library. Uh, there's a new card view, and so um, this will this will actually cast a um, a static shadow uh, for older versions of Android. Um, and in, in Lollipop, it'll be a dynamic shadow. There's a new uh, toolbar that I mentioned. The toolbar is basically a subclass of the view group, um, and, it's, and it's a reusable component. So it, it's part of the Lollipop framework, and it's coming to App and Path. Um, so if you use Action Bar Sherlock today, it's probably a good time to switch to App and Path, which is basically the same thing, uh, but we'll have some of the new newer additions to um, to backport Lollipop features. I think Action Bar Sherlock is actually not being maintained anymore. The author said, like, switch to after path because we wasn't maintaining that. So take a look at that. Um, it's a pretty simple transition because they're very similar um, libraries. Um, and you can now designate any toolbar as an app bar, right? So even if it's not the very top thing in the interface, as, as you're seeing there. So it's, it's more flexible with material. You can hide it, you can transform it, you can draw over it. Um, you can change its height and its width. And uh, the floating action button is, is probably a signature interaction piece of your app. So if there's something that's really the, the thing that you want to encourage people to do, right? Like in Gmail, it would be like compose an email. That might be the, the big thing that I want you to do. It might be like share, it might be upload a photo, whatever it is uh, sort of big call to action. You want to think about having a floating action button for that. And it's a really neat way to, to have users you know, realize what it is that the primary function is on a particular screen. Okay, and finishing up with some resources. Um, so everything about material design is at google.com slash design. It's all quite new. So even uh, yesterday we released 
a bunch more uh, design specs and a bunch more um, things for you guys to look at. There's now standardized icons which are available, and it's like the same icon set that's being used across Android and web, um, so that like the trash icon is consistent everywhere you use it, and, and users will start to associate that with, okay, this is the trash icon, that sort of thing. So there's color palettes there um, for, for you to use as well. Um, that's just a very good resource for everything to do with material design. Of course, uh, the YouTube channel, there's a couple of good talks. Um, there's one, there's a design bites for Roman Nurex, um, talking talking about material design. There's a session from Google I.O. Uh, with Matthias, who's sort of like the, the god of material design, taking questions, uh, which is quite good. And of course, you know developer.android.com for, for developer documentation, and Google Plus at uh, Plus Android Developers. Um, so all the I.O. videos, uh, again, if you haven't seen, um, you know, take a look. There's good sessions on material design as well as a bunch of other things. The I.O. app that I mentioned, uh, you, can, you can get it from GitHub. Uh, if there's one thing you do, I would recommend this one, because it's not just material design, it's, it's just clean code in general. And if anyone has any questions, I can pick up. Not exactly from a design background, but just uh, can you compare responsive design versus the adaptive design? So it's a similar, similar concept. Um, similar concepts. I think one thing that we want to point out with adaptive design um, is that it's okay to have lots of white space in certain circumstances. So you don't necessarily need to have your content respond and take advantage of all the pixels on the screen. For, for certain types of applications like reading, there's actually a physical limit that we as humans have at which point it stops being comfortable to read like super long uh, things. So it, it's just adapting, it's, it's synonymous, but we're just we're pointing out a couple additional things that we think are important. Um, and we basically have now a, a, a suggestion for what to do with that extra white space. And that is put some of your big bold coloring in there to add value to the brand, but very similar concepts. Cool. Um, you mentioned about the app that's floating in the uh, Is it a new widget? Yes. So is uh, this only for Lollipop? No, it's actually backported. Um, it'll work in, in other older Android versions as well. So that one is, is, is built in and backported, so you can use that safely. Yeah. Is there any source code or any example code available which is incorporating uh, material design? Yeah, that's the IO app. So it's open source? It's open source on GitHub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And it has like the floating action button, it has adaptive design, it has motion, um, it has basically all the things that I talked about. But now it'll make more sense to you because you'll look out for those things. Yeah. Cool. All right, well, thank you very much, guys.